Hey YouTube, Mike the Alpha Order here. Thanks for joining me today. I've got a bit of a random video. Uh, I suppose it's aimed at younger viewers, but I don't know, maybe other people will find the conversation interesting. Uh, it's based on some prompts that I've had from viewers over the last few months. A uh, bit of uh, finance questions. And so I um, thought it might be interesting to talk about it while we look at some cards. So uh, the question that sort of started was, how is it that I'm able to afford all this stuff that I show on the channel? And I've answered that in other videos. Um, that's not today's, today's topic. Let me just get this loud box open quick. Long story short, on that I spent, uh, I don't know, four years in corporate America when I got out of university. And I left at, at that point to try and start my own company. And over the course of the next decade, I, um, I did that. I started a software business. I was broke for a couple of years. During that time, my wife worked and paid all the bills. And uh, after many years of running very hard, I finally found some traction. Oh yeah, this is gonna be a good start. And since then I've also created a real estate business and the two together are, are my income engine. But um, anyway, from there the conversation kind of went to how does someone who's not in my particular financial situation uh, get started on this track? Ancestral MTG, this is Joel Mix's store. Definitely check him out. I had him on the channel a long while back. Uh, he's an awesome guy, big part of the community. Very trustworthy, awesome cards. So there's my unsponsored pitch. Uh, but anyway, how, how could somebody who is interested in this stuff um, get started on this track, you know, if maybe starting a business isn't their cup of tea? Or just how do you get your finances in order so that you can do some alternative investing and collecting? Uh, so I want to discuss that today. But first, let's look at some cards. Badlands. I love Alpha Duels. Just so cool, so unique. And with those with those borders and the coloring that you get in Alpha, it's pretty hard to beat. And we've got two of them here. Nice. There are still a number of cards I need in my quest. Uh, I mentioned in my last video that I'm slowing down my uh, my buying, um, and that's true. But I suppose uh, before I confuse my dear viewers, uh, I explained in the last video. Um, I am spending less, but I also have an astronomical backlog of, of packages. So uh, some of them are spanning back like nine months. I got what's this one. This is April of 2023. So just to give you an idea, it's even longer. So I got plenty to open. Um, I'm an absolute black belt at this point in delay of gratification. So. If you're curious why I can float a message out there like that one and still open piles of packages, that's why. Uh, many of these are quite old. Some of them aren't, but many of them are. Um, anyway, yeah, so how to get going on this track. Um, obviously, you know, there's no sort of step-by-step -step guide to, to anything in life or in finance, but um, 
if I had to bring it down to one goal, I would say get out of debt. That would be my advice to you. Beautiful lions. Don't start buying any of this stuff until you have solved any debt problems you might have. That is your first priority. So uh, why is that? Well, in my opinion, cash flow is the most important tool that you have if, if you're looking at wealth building. Cash flow meaning the net amount of money that lands in your bank account after all of your unavoidable expenses. You know, your uh, utilities, your taxes, um, rent or mortgage, all that sort of stuff. So how can you increase your cash flow? Um, there's a couple ways. First, uh, you can try to improve your income, obviously. Um, ooh, Ancestral again, look at that. I didn't even realize these were both from Joel. Uh, a useful thing to know if you didn't, and this is according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, um, they found that the average person working 45 hours a week earns about 44% more than the average person who's working 40 hours a week. Ooh, clean card. I talked last time about signatures. Um, I don't love them, but I also don't mind them. I believe this is an older Amy Weber. Someone who knows more about signatures can, uh, can tell me. It became a bit more sort of um, circular and flowery. But that's a very clean card. I like that. Uh, what was I just saying? Oh, um, right. So, so basically, if you work five hours more a week, 13% more, um, your sort of career, I don't know, expectation value, I guess, increases by 44%. Uh, now, that's, that's obviously not some kind of magical hack or something. Um, it certainly doesn't apply to all environments. Uh, it's a correlation, not a causation. But I can tell you, you know, as as a sort of small business owner, uh, I've gone through, you know, I've had, I had, have, or have gone through well over a hundred employees at this point. It is impossible to find somebody who gives a shit. To find somebody who cares, who, who does the work and is actually tuned in. They're not just there for the paycheck. That is, such a rare thing. And, and let me tell you, 100%, um, if, I, if I ever find anyone like that, it catches my attention right away. You know, if, if basically anyone shows me that they give a shit. Uh, and, and a simple way to do that, say, is to be the first one in and the last one out, you know, which we might only be talking about a half hour. If you're a half hour in before other people, and you're staying a half hour later than most people, there's your five extra hours a week. There's your 44%. I see that and I grab those people as fast as I can for a promotion um, or for another opportunity to see, to see what they've got. And uh, that's because it is just so hard to find those people. There is a, I don't know if you'd call it a rule or a law or, or something, but um, it's, called, it's called Price's Law, I guess. I guess you could call it a law. Guy is liege. Cool card. One of only a couple with the stars instead of the X's. I don't think this is a big uh, player favorite, but I guess someone else who knows better can tell me. Um, but I love it. I've always loved it. I always thought it was such a cool idea. Um, Price's Law says that in any group about half of the work is done by the square root of the number of people involved. So if you've got 15 employees in a company, three or four of them 
are doing half of all the work. And the other 11 or 12 combined are doing the other half. And I would imagine most of you see this in your own work environment. Um, I bet you could probably pick out the, the few. If you have 100 employees, half of the work's being done by only 10 people. And these people are your rock stars. That's sort of the term. Everyone is looking for, for new rock stars because they drive business. They drive success. They can, they can run new initiatives. They can get things done. If you make yourself a rock star, any competent manager or owner is going to notice immediately. I promise you that. Uh, and you know, it's often not about intelligence or special abilities or even tons of experience in all cases. It's more often than not, it's just about giving a shit. It's just about following through on things, getting done what needs to be done. It's not that hard, and yet it is so hard to find people that can do that. So, okay, that's increasing income. Let's see, what have we here? Security checked the contents. Ooh, all right, I hope, that's, I hope that doesn't mean there's a problem. Uh, okay, so on, on the flip side of increasing your income is decreasing your overhead. I would encourage you to have a budget. Know what you are spending your money on. Specifically and exactly. Know what you're spending your money on. Um, you know, it's delightful to have Netflix and Disney+, Plus, but... You know, guess what? If you gave these things up for a couple of years, you're still going to live a happy life, I, I would imagine. Uh, so once you have yourself on a budget, you can look at all the discretionary stuff. You can see how much you're spending um, and, and what that kind of represents of your total income. And then you can start thinking about what you might be able to do with that amount of money if you reallocated it for a little while. Not forever, but for a little while. And in the category of expenses, of course, are debt obligations. Student loans, car payments, mortgage payments, credit card debt, all that kind of stuff. These things are absolutely terrible for cash flow. They are the worst for cash flow. They're, they're structured very much on purpose by the lenders to be long-term when possible. Um, and that's for their benefit, not yours. Uh, and they include interest. And debt payments can completely stifle your mobility. And, and they cost you a fortune in the long run. A 30-year mortgage at 5%, for example, um, when that's all paid off, it amounts to, to almost double the original loan amount. It's crazy. And, uh, you know, credit cards, I mean, geez, you're talking 20, 25% on those things. It's total insanity. So, what do you do if you have debt? Well, look at your cash flow. Uh, focus particularly on um, if you should spend any time either changing jobs or, you know, kind of, as I said before, just recommit yourself to the job you already have and make yourself a top performer. See if you can raise that number. Um, make the budget, like I said. Be realistic, but you also have to be honest. You know, when you map out your grocery budget, how much of that is the food you need to eat and how much of that is, you know, snacks and beer? This is a very hard card to find centered, and you can see here. I've actually, I continued to search for a truly near mint copy for my master binder. I don't have one yet. I have a lot of copies, but every single one of them has something wrong. This one is, is pretty nice, except for the centering. Yeah, pity. Uh, but anyway, Break out those numbers. Know what you need to spend from what you just sort of enjoy spending. Cool card. I always liked this one. Let's 
So anyway, once you've once you've mapped all that out, you can see kind of easily what your discretionary spending is. And if you haven't budgeted before, you're probably going to be surprised by how much it is. Oh, another jump for the horde. Thank goodness. Just remember, people, you can never have too many jumps. So yeah, figure out how much you can cut. And again, we're not talking forever. Because um, anything you can stop spending, you can now allocate to a new separate fund um, that you'll manage on the side. Something that you don't touch for any of these regular expenses. And this is your sort of life plan fund. Your, uh, your wealth planning fund, if you will. Eventually, it will be your discretionary playground. But it starts by having something set aside that you can contribute to as much as possible on a monthly basis. Uh, and that you can't access too easily. And with that separate account sort of growing and you know safe from being spent, you want to allocate a couple of piles in there. First, I would encourage you to have an emergency fund. The idea is that if you're going to spend all this time coming up with a financial plan and sort of having these long-term goals, you really don't want to get knocked way off course by, you know, your furnace going or a minor car accident or, you know, an injury. These things can knock you out and that's really discouraging. So. The very first thing you should do when you start allocating on the side is put in some kind of buffer so that if you do get punched in the nuts, which is going to happen, it hits that buffer, you can refill the buffer, nothing got messed up in your life plan. Uh, I would say at least $1,000. And for the more conservative, ooh, fast bond. For the more conservative, you know, put aside three, six, whatever months worth of, it can be six months worth of expenses. It can be six months worth of paychecks, whatever it is, but pick the number you want. And for a little while, make that your only priority. Get that emergency fund set up. I wonder if I should cut this guy out. Eight, five is the line. Nine or better, I definitely don't, you know, chop out almost ever. Um, I think I did chop out the, what was that? What was that volcanic island? But that's because it had to be in the binder. This looks like maybe an overgraded 8.5, to be honest. Centering 8, huh? Yeah, I guess the back is not so great. Well, we'll decide about that later. Anyway, once, once you've filled up an emergency fund, you're going to keep putting money aside, and that's going to now be this... Uh, the spending fund that we're talking about it. Eventually, this is going to be where you're doing your retirement investments, you know, maybe accumulating for a down payment on a house, an investment property, as well as this alternative asset stuff, um, you know, either as a collection or as an investment, whatever. Uh, but before all that, I would recommend you start using that money for paying off your debts. And that's because investing while carrying any kind of debt, it's just less than ideal. Um, your ROI, any ROI you might realize on your investments is basically less the interest rates that you're paying. And your spending bandwidth is tightened. And it just takes longer for compounding to sort of get into a nice feedback loop. So that's why I think you should start there. And uh, you know, trust me, I know from experience, I had student loans, um, car payment, a mortgage. I had the things. Uh, it's slow at first. Um, it's very slow in the beginning. It feels like you're not getting much done. But if you're diligent, you know, you really do get a snowball effect and you start gaining momentum. The down payment for my first investment property took years to accumulate. Um, it took me a long time to pay off my house. 
You know, that it is what it is. There's no overnight solution. But we'll come back to mortgages in a minute. Uh, I would say you want to deal with non-mortgage debt first. And personally, I like to hit the highest interest rate stuff first and go from there. Uh, I also like going one by one. As you clear a debt, you can then direct all of that additional cash flow to the next loan. And since you have one less, less um, interest payment sort of factored in on your cash flow, you actually get a bit more spending power. You know, once that loan is fully cleared, you have a bit more spending power. So there's a bit of a snowball there too. Ooh, that's a really nice Cyclopean. Epic card. I love this artwork. Beautiful. Mono artifact. No casting cost by mistake. It's my favorite error in the set. Lovely. Uh, so yeah, I, I do recommend getting one completely off the books and then going to the next one, as opposed to spreading it between everything evenly, you know, each month. Get yourself down to just a mortgage payment if you have one. And then, then you can do a bit more, a bit more calculus because it gets a little bit more complicated with the best thing to do with a mortgage. I'll share a few thoughts and opinions. Um, first of all, if you're in, hold on, let me open this. If you are early in your mortgage term, I would be very aggressive doing extra payments, anything you can. If you've never looked at the amortization table, you definitely should. A single extra principal payment early on can knock months off the back end of the loan. And that's because the way they structure the repayments is at first you're paying, you know, pennies to the principal and all the rest is interest in your monthly payment. It's like that and that. Um, and because the principal is going down by so little, the interest continues to accumulate at the high rate. If you pay, you know, say a full month extra, you know, whatever you could afford, um, that could be six months worth of um, payments off the principal, basically. So if you're early in the term, I would definitely recommend that. Uh, personally, I went for my mortgage and I paid it off very aggressively. I was doing some retirement contributions in parallel, but I would say, you know, it's like 85% of my sort of extra income energy was, was shooting at that mortgage payment. So let's take a look at these. This is an older package because I have not been purchasing commons in, in a long while, but, uh, Ooh, quite a set I picked up here. These are the ABU Games stickers. I don't remember if I got this directly from them or eBay. Nice condition stuff, though. Man, it isn't anything quite like a really clean alpha card, even a common. You know what I mean? Look at those crisp edges, the black. Ooh, I love it. Big pile today. It's because I'm ranting. I'll try to wrap this up. Uh, mortgages, right? So I, I have heard, I have heard people say that you really shouldn't bother um, with a mortgage, particularly a low interest mortgage. Um, you know, very aggressively. Uh, let me see how I'm going to open this set. I don't want to crush the cards while I'm trying to open new ones. Uh, the argument sort of goes um, over, the, over the lifetime of a loan. If you just look at inflation, you are effectively paying less and less money over time, right? So your, your payment is constant but your income is hopefully rising with inflation. And so effectively, you're paying less and less. The inflation rate minus the mortgage rate is sort of the effective interest rate. Uh, and because of that, you'd perhaps be better off investing that money rather than using it to pay off the debt. Uh, I think that's probably correct 
if you are maximizing for return under best case conditions uh, and not accounting for risk. So, you know, take it or leave it, I think. There's no right answer. Uh, but there's a couple things that need to be accounted for, I would say, to put context to that point of view. Another old package. Man, I buy a lot of alpha cards. Yay. A graded twiddle. I don't remember that at all. Must have been well priced. This I'll, this I'll chop out even though it's a nine. Man, CGC, ever since they redid their labels, have you seen how many tens are out there? It's like 10 doesn't even mean anything anymore. I guess they have different tens. They got like the black 10 and the, the gold 10 or something. But honestly, I, I was happy with CGC for a while. I really thought they were doing a good job grading, but now I just, I see the tens, I just roll my eyes. But uh, yeah, I'll probably break that slab because I don't really need a comment in there. Um, okay, right, so just a couple of things to, um, to consider here. The first is that inflation also reduces your ROI on an investment return. So it's, it's not as easy as just saying you, you get around inflation. Ooh. The fun thing about waiting so long is I'm genuinely surprised at what's in the packages. Very cool. Love righteousness. This is a Doug Schuler. Oh, that's a clean one. Plus seven, plus seven was so badass. I remember seeing this and just not believing it was a card for one. Now it is defending creature, but still. How epic. Uh, so, you know, if you were to say put $20,000 into a market investment, right? And let's just say you got 8% um, return on that over the course of a year. And inflation was say 2% that same year. So effectively, you only got 6% return, right? So the same, the same factors in there. And then, and then even less, if you actually need the money and you sell that you know, profit, you're now subject to a taxable capital gains event. So uh, you know, I'm not saying that you end up ahead or behind one way or the other. I'm just saying it's complicated. It's more complicated than that. Um, second thing is risk. So obviously, there's no guarantees what a market's going to return. So that makes one half of that equation a little bit difficult. Um, but additionally, you know, holding a mortgage represents a risk. Shit happens in life. And uh, there is always a risk of losing the house to the bank. And that's no fun. And I think sometimes people disregard risk just because you can't really put a monetary number on it. But um, it's a real thing. and. I think sometimes it's worth a slightly less, slightly lower ROI for a lower risk situation. That's up to the individual, of course. Ooh, I think we have another jump. I'm almost done. I know this is going long. Uh, the third and final thing I would say is about cash flow and, uh, you know, I guess the time value of money. So I've talked on this channel before about liquidity and um, card liquidity, but in this case, I mean personal liquidity and, and also, uh, you know, opportunity costs. Ooh, nice little set. Another jump. You, you want to be able to make moves in life. Opportunities come up. They come up for everyone eventually. The trouble is you don't know when it's coming and you don't know what opportunity it is. And so it will surprise you and you are either in a position to move on it or you're not. You know, uh, maybe a friend has ran into a situation and they would like to sell you their house for under market just because they need to close right away. 
maybe a you know similar situation maybe a local lgs is closing and they want to unload some unlimited power and they don't want to have to deal with ebay and shipping and fraud They're, they just need it done these things happen um, or any other investment could come up that you think is is worthwhile having money that you can spend as opposed to in an investment account is worth something uh, being liquid is worth something so the question is how best to get liquid you know of course you could choose not to pay off debts once you've done your budget and set up your emergency fund you could just use everything else you have to sort of be liquid um, and you know just hold that uh, but that's sort of the lowest possible cash flow that you can get out of your income given your expenses and if you're not taking care of those other things you're locking yourself into that that cash flow so you could do that um, to be instantly liquid ooh but to also sort of have the least the least uh, spending power that's that's available to you another option is not worry about the debts invest everything into the market for you know potentially higher long-term returns uh, in this situation again you're not liquid right now um, you're not really liquid later either because everything's sort of on paper and you're still cash flow constrained by your debts so you're not liquid until much later um, you know probably not the first choice love this card very clean copy I spent a while chasing a clean copy of Willow it was hard to find I don't know if that's because this was really playable or or what but uh, this is a nice one very clean I love that artwork Ooh, a lot of nice rares nice day today uh, yeah or or um, you could spend some time paying off debts and you will be less liquid in the short term you know depending on your situation because you're spending everything on clearing these these obligations but once they're out of the way your cash flow maximizes within you know whatever you're earning and spending you now have the maximum liquidity and you'll be able to stay that way the great thing about cash flow is it just keeps coming right it's not sort of once and done so uh, yeah I think that's my rant for today I probably went too long uh, you know I got uh, I've had a handful of different questions along this topic and so I was trying to squeeze multiple things in so sorry about that I hope you at least weren't bored by the by the cards but um, yeah I mean the other thing is no single point of advice you know financial advice works for everybody right so there is no one answer even something as basic as you know invest you should invest in mutual funds right I mean that's pretty hard to argue against although the truth is there are actually reasons that using um, indexes and mutual funds it's actually a bad idea for some people um, particularly if you have a larger portfolio that's outside the scope of this video but the point is that nothing is is a one-size-fits-all when it comes to finance so you know none of this is uh, really financial advice for your particular situation it's just some thoughts and um, some thoughts informed by experiences for you to consider and uh, yeah that's what I got so if you want to buy cards like this someday get your finances in order first this is not the way to get you know to that you need to get to that first then you can mess around uh, and personally I would say that becoming debt-free is a very powerful step in that direction so all right, that's what I got today. Thanks as always for joining me, and I will see you at the next one. Thanks for watching today's content. If you're enjoying my videos, it means the chip that I've implanted in your head is still working. On the other hand, if you're starting to not enjoy my videos, please leave a comment so that I can find out where you are and change the battery. See you next time.